on. So I'll go ahead and kick this off for everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to be a part of our webinar today. We're happy to have participation from both County Council and the Department of Public Health. The purpose of this webinar will be to provide additional clarity and guidance to some of the various sections of the current public health orders in place. To start, my name is Lauren Cartwright. I'm the Business Retention and Expansion Program Manager at the Sonoma County Economic Development Board. I will be the moderator for today's session. This morning, we're joined by Dr. Sundari Mace, the Public Health Officer for the County of Sonoma, Jennifer Klein, Chief Deputy County Counsel for the County of Sonoma, as well as Sita Kutiera, the De De Deputy County Counsel for the County of Sonoma. Please know that during this session, we'll also have a Spanish translation channel available. Please navigate to the bottom of your screen to listen in this format. We are also recording each webinar and will post publicly in the coming days. Here, so as we get started. All right, so today's presentation is going to begin with an overview of the current situation of COVID-19 in Sonoma County from Dr. Mace, followed by a detailed interpretation from Jennifer and Sita of the various health orders currently in place within the county. We ask that you please save your questions until the end of the presentation, where we will then open it up for live Q&A session with our various webinar hosts. In the case that we are not able to answer all questions during today's time, we will work with our panelists to retrieve the necessary information and we'll follow up after the event. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. As we are all coming pro to Zoom, sometimes there are noises in the background, but we'll go ahead and work the best we can. <laughs> all right, I'll begin to share my screen. We'll get you started, Dr. Mace. Okay, hi everybody. I hope you can hear me. I'm sorry, some of that noise is actually right where I am and it's not controllable, but it's good to be with all of you uh, today. What we want to do over the course of the next hour is to review, um, well, I'll give you some background first, but then review the public health basis for recent orders and yeah, review key provisions of the orders. Yes. Okay, so we'll go to the background. So as you know, this all started as a, um, in December of 2019 in Wuhan City in China, um, a novel coronavirus was identified. It's novel because uh, it's never been a pathogen, in other words, never caused disease in human beings before. So it was initially detected as a cluster of pneumonia cases. Um, there was exposure to a local, local open area market. Next slide, please. And a little bit about coronaviruses. They are viruses. You can see the electron micrograph picture here on the right hand side. Um, they're enveloped uh, RNA viruses. They infect both animals and human beings. And there's four common strains that circulate worldwide. Um, of note, they actually do cause the common cold as well. So um, that puts it in context. Um, next slide, please. So COVID-19 was uh, coined sometime uh, in early January. CO stands for corona, uh, v, VI for the virus, and D for disease. And 19 is just 2019, which is a year in which the, this new strain of virus was detected. And we call uh, the virus itself, which you see a picture of here on the right from CDC, SARS-CoV-2. So next slide, please. Oh, what I wanted to say before I get to the global update is uh, simply that We've had these viruses before. I don't know if you remember, but in 2002, we had SARS. And SARS um, was a big deal, but we only really had a few cases, maybe even just um, eight or so in the United States. And it was uh, limited in transmission, but the mortality was much higher, about 10%. And then we had MERS, the Mediterranean Eastern Respiratory uh, Syndrome virus, and that uh, MERS uh, caused only one case in all of uh, the United States. So it wasn't a big deal. The mortality was much higher, about 30% or so. Um, then now we have this new coronavirus and what's the big deal? Well, it has a much higher case fatality rate than say influenza. Influenza causes a lot of deaths every year, but there's a vaccine. And the case fatality is about 0.1%. This we think is at least 1% if not higher. It's been as high, uh, reported to be, have a fatality rate of uh, as high as 5%. So that's why this is a big deal. Globally mm -hmm. now, we have 2,600,003 2, uh, cases or so confirmed. We've already had 
80,000, almost 181,000 deaths, it looks like. And as you can see, every country has been affected with uh, the virus, just about. And the ones that are still white probably just haven't detected the virus yet, since it's a global pandemic and it's, uh, many people can be infected and actually be asymptomatic. In fact, a full one third of those who get infected with this virus could potentially be asymptomatic, no symptoms, and therefore not come to medical attention at all. So it has spread widely, as we'd expect, because it's spread from person to person uh, by the respiratory route, by cough, sneezing, talking, singing, and also direct contact. So as you've heard in the different town halls and webinars, uh, it can be transmitted by touch and also from surfaces. So if a surface has virus on it, potentially we could get um, infected by touching a surface that has virus on it. Next slide, please. So for the national update, you can see we have um, as of uh, April 20th, 800,000 cases with about 45,000 deaths. Um, and you can see every state is reporting uh, virus. There's none here that are white. Luckily, we are able to test to, uh, and we're, our testing capacity is increasing. So we'll be detecting more and more uh, cases of COVID. We may even uh, test more asymptomatic people and even perform some antibody testing to see who was infected. The first case was re reported in Washington, January 21st. The first case of suspected transmission here in California in Solano County in February 26th. And the first death was reported in King County, Washington in February 29th. Since that, of course, uh, since that time, it's evolved quite a bit, as I've noted. Next slide, please. California, we now have 33,000 plus cases. And, um, you can take a look at uh, the ages. The age group that's most affected is those that are 18 to 49, um, but also those who are 50 to 64 and greater than 65 are experiencing a good number of cases as well. It's the younger folks that we're not seeing a lot of cases in, probably because they're not symptomatic with the virus. It doesn't mean that they don't have infection, we're just not picking it up because they're probably asymptomatic. It's about half and half male, female, and you can see the hospitalizations, we've had 3,365 confirmed COVID hospitalizations, about one third of them are in the ICU and very ill. Suspected uh, COVID, we have about 1,500 cases and a smaller amount of those in the ICU. We've had 1,268 deaths um, as of April 20th. So our shelter in place has been very effective in minimizing the number of hospitalizations and deaths and likely the number of cases as well. And you can see from the map, it's the urban centers, the cities like LA and the Bay Area that are mostly being affected, San Diego as well. Please, um, uh, next slide, please. In the Bay Area, what's happening? Well, I know you've all heard Santa Clara is the hot spot with nearly 2000 cases, followed closely by Alameda, San Francisco, um, San Mateo, Contra Costa and Marin but we are actually very close to Marin with 192 cases and uh, Solano trails us just by 10 cases or so. So the other counties are more rural, they're further out and they're not seeing as many cases um, and partly because we put the shelter in place into place in effect. And I think our counties uh, having shelter in place in effect has really limited the amount of community transmission. In fact, we're seeing more and more cases amongst contacts to active cases and not in the community. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so I'm gonna turn this over uh, to our county council to continue and I'll take questions in the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mace. Uh, Jennifer and Sita, I'll let you two take it away from here. Jennifer, I think you're on mute. Oh, <laughs> oh and so many times you can practice and yet. Right. <laughs> uh, very good. Uh, so the order is available on uh, the Sonoma County's uh, website and uh, in addition to Appendix A, which we'll reference later. Uh, so if you haven't read it, you can uh, access it there. The basic structure of the order, uh, we go over the intent and the basis of the order, which um, is a lot of the public health evidence that Dr. Mace um, noted, and it's continued to evolve. Uh, the 
point of the order is obviously to shelter in place, um, which is to maximize the number of people staying home uh, and people only leaving for authorized reasons. There's some key terms in the order and that social distancing and hygiene requirements, minimum basic operations for non-essential businesses, essential activities for all people, uh, essential travel and essential business, uh, and businesses defined to include nonprofits. So uh, what we're gonna focus on here are the essential businesses that are related to the agricultural industry. And the, those are defined sort of with an exemplar list. Go ahead, next slide, please. Uh, again, essential business is defined under the order. Um, we've already just gone over the intent of the order. Um, one requirement of essential businesses is that they uh, have a social distancing pro protocol uh, developed and posted and provided to all employees. Um, and any employees that can work from home need to work from home. And to the extent there are any specific state guidance for your industry, um, you have to follow that as well. Next slide. Again, several categories of business that we'll go over as essential. The first, uh, food. So farmers markets, farm stands, grocery stores, and all others engaged in retail sale of a significant amount of unprepared food, including produce, meat, fish, poultry. Farmers markets may operate, um, and there are some specific guidelines for those. Um, if you could click on that link, it'll just show people what that guidance document looks like, although I'm not going to go over it in depth. Is that working? There it goes. So as you can see, as she kind of scrolls through it there, that um, it covers uh, retail beverage, food service, um, and other things. Um, so farmers markets will fall under you know, those re um, requirements. Food trucks, that's fine. We can close it. People can reference that at their leisure. Food delivery um, is also considered an essential business. So shipping, delivering groceries, and food to market or residences or businesses. Next slide, please. Agricultural products. So all of these are essential businesses and may operate. However, uh, while you may operate, you do have to be closed to the public. So that means that uh, tasting rooms, and other um, parts of your business that are normally open to the public must be closed. Wineries, breweries, dairies, farms, creameries, licensed cannabis uh, operations, ranches, and all other businesses engaged in activities to bring food, beverage, or ag products to market um, are allowable. Uh, again, closed to the public. The exception here is that retail sales to the public may occur via curbside pickup, delivery, shipping, farm and produce stands or farmer's markets were otherwise allowable by law. So um, you know, check the, your other legal requirements if you can um, do those sorts of uh, sales. Uh, we also recommend you know, making appointments for pickup and things like that, depending on how remote you are. Next slide. Business engaged in the production or cultivation, processing, testing, or distribution of food, beverage, or other agricultural products. Um, they have to be closed to the public, again, except for uh, curbside and other types of you know, distanced um, pickup. Uh, Sita, if you could comment here um, on uh, cannabis, I'd appreciate it. Sure, um, just to clarify from earlier, if you guys were paying attention to the prior health order license cannabis businesses were listed as healthcare operations. And what we've done in the second health order is instead reclassify licensed cannabis businesses as agricultural businesses. And so they're able to operate more similarly to a winery, brewery, or other ag production facility that um, might have a retail component. So dispensaries can operate under this section as well. 
And uh, as Jennifer mentioned, they have to be close to the public, uh, which is the case for most licensed cannabis businesses anyway. And retail facilities can only sell via curbside pickup and delivery. Thank you. Uh, all right, next slide. Uh, businesses, again, providing ag products, farms, ranches, uh, fisheries, dairies, creameries, wineries, breweries, and licensed cannabis businesses. In addition, agricultural support businesses are considered essential businesses. Uh, that is a business engaged in the production, cultivation, processing, testing, or distribution of food Sorry, businesses that support businesses that are engaged in the production, cultivation, processing, testing, or distribution of food, beverage, or other agricultural products. So that would be a, a I think I have an example coming up next. Oh, guess not. <laughs> I guess I do. Uh, so farm management companies, food and beverage processing, equipment dealerships, fuel companies, mobile and fixed mechanics, ag uh, transportation services and companies providing seed, nursery stock, fer fertilizer, livestock, uh, feed, and crop production products. Next slide. Food suppliers. Uh, these are businesses that have the primary function of shipping or delivering food, groceries directly to residences or businesses. Um, I don't think the exemption doesn't really apply here. But go ahead. Next slide. Food for the needy, this is if you're uh, providing food directly to a um, food bank or a, or a shelter. Next. Um, I think I might have taken out an example um, that I just wanted to highlight. So something like, uh, and maybe it's in the FAQs, but if you have um, a label maker or a bottle cap manufacturer, you know, those businesses that are essential for packaging your products may also continue to operate. So uh, it, being a, an essential business and you're operating, uh, what social distancing, hygiene, and facial covering requirements are there? Next slide. So as you may know, effective last Friday, uh, the Sonoma County has a public face covering order. Face coverings are meant to protect the public from the user in, the case, in case the user is infected and not displaying symptoms. They cover the mouth and the nose. They're you know, typically fabric. Um, there's a little bit of, just to clarify, this is, these are not medical grade masks that are protecting the wearer. So we wanna save those supplies for the medical community. And obviously it's, it's not a substitute for social distancing. We wanna maintain good hygiene and stay you know, at least six feet away from um, others to the extent possible. Thank you. Next slide. In addition to, to the general rule of social distancing and hygiene, there now in the new order is a specific requirement for every essential business to uh, develop and post and to provide to their employees a social distancing protocol. Uh, there, an example of this is at Appendix A. Um, is, it on, is, is there a copy of Appendix A on the next slide? Oh, maybe I took it out. Um, Appendix A is also on the website. It's the link below the link to um, uh, the order. So an example of where you'll want a really good protocol is where you have some shared spaces where people are, um, oh, it's okay. <laughs> um, shared spaces where people are sharing um, or potentially sharing hoses, feed scoops, um, tools, that they use to tend to um, you know, plants or animals and really wanna make sure that there are good um, opportunities for hand washing and sanitizing and separation, um, maybe having dedicated tools to different people. Uh, these are the so sorts of things you're gonna to wanna to think about as you, um, you know, put your protocols in place. Next slide. And then also to chime in as well, um, we have a list at the end of the PowerPoint about different resources available. So when we send out the recap and the video recording to all attendees after this webinar, we can make sure to call out the Appendix A that Jennifer was referring to as well. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Oh, there it is. There's just a little snip of what Appendix A looks like. It's about two pages to fill out. Next slide. Uh, essential travel. Uh, 
for your purposes. Uh, travel for uh, engaging in essential businesses is um, allowed. And um, we have had some questions about, you know, um, I, you know, if I have a vineyard in two different counties and the other county has a less restrictive um, uh, order than, than Sonoma County, um, you know, wh whose order do I follow? The rule of thumb, follow the order of the county that you're in at the time. I think all counties have, have designated agriculture as essential, so I don't think there's a problem sort of transporting workers from vineyard to vineyard, even if you're crossing the county line. Next slide. Okay, more frequently asked questions. Let's see, we'll go through them. When will the orders be lifted? Um, I'll go over the answer here, and if Dr. Mace would like to comment further, she of course can. Next slide. At this stage in the emergency, it's essential to slow the virus transmission as much as possible to protect the most vulnerable and to prevent the healthcare system from being overwhelmed. The public health officer has been closely monitoring the situation and the need for modifications to the, ex to the existing orders as conditions warrant. Next slide. So at this time, there's not a specific date or time frame for, for specific plans for how the county might ease restrictions on businesses. Uh, of course, you know, as soon as the county knows what changes it's going to make, it will post on its website and work with media partners to um, push out what that information is. Next slide. Oh, uh, Dr. Mace, did you want to add anything there? No. Okay. Uh, I know sometimes it takes a minute for people to unmute, but uh, go ahead, next slide. Uh, frequently asked question, what is this, number two, uh, can I still buy food and beverage from Sonoma County restaurants, wineries, breweries, and other establishments? Um, in general, yes, you can still uh, submit your order. Uh, those businesses can receive customer orders via telephone and online for takeout or delivery only. Uh, again, ideally arranged by appointment and done curbside or in a parking lot. Uh, all in compliance with social distancing and other protective measures and hand washing. The shelter in place order does not prohibit food and beverage establishments from continuing to ship their products, whether retail or wholesale. Uh, if this per person who wants their products can uh, also contact uh, delivery services, um, which may charge a fee. Next slide, please. Can a farmer's market operate? Yes. Uh, but farmers markets must follow the uh, California Department of Public Health guidance that we identified earlier. And these um, requirements are going to be stricter than just general social distancing and hygiene requirements. Next slide. Can I continue to operate my cannabis dispensary? Um, you can have, Sita's already uh, gone over this, but yes, dispensaries and retail facilities and delivery companies may only sell cannabis and cannabis products via curbside pickup or delivery. Dispensaries, retail facilities selling via curbside pickup should encourage customers to call their order ahead of time. The customers do not need a medical ID card or physician's recommendation uh, to purchase as uh, Sita went over now that the order has been changed. Next slide, please. Uh, I'll see, I'll, 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 we'll break it up and have a different presenter. Would you like to go over this uh, frequently asked question? Um, this is about whether cannabis businesses can continue to operate. And I might have covered this as we were going through the slide um, that yes, licensed cannabis businesses are allowed to remain open. And this is regardless of whether you have an A license or an M license or both. Um, and regardless of whether your permit allows medical or adult use, we aren't distinguishing for purposes of the order and your ability to continue operating. Um, and I, I think the rest of this FAQ is about dispensaries and retail facilities, which we've also gone over. Um, one more thing to add to Jennifer's comments about when the restrictions will be lifted is just that um, a lot of that depends on what the state is going to do going forward. And so we'll be working with them on that. That's a very good point. Um, and I should have pointed that out at the beginning that um, you know, the, there is a statewide shelter in place order um, and that we have to um, 
follow that. So we're, we're prevented in uh, what we can do to loosen uh, our restrictions locally. Um, we can't be less restrictive than the state. Next slide, please. Can a nursery business continue to operate under the health order? A retail nursery may continue to operate and be open to the public if it sells a significant amount of essential products, even if it sells some non-essential products as well. For example, those essential products include vegetable starts, fruit trees, vegetable seeds, fertilizer, and other products necessary for cultivating food. Uh, wholesale nursery uh, may also operate um, to support businesses engaged in the production and cultivation of food, beverage, and other agricultural products. So if the, however, if the wholesale nursery produces or sells other products, it must, to the extent feasible, scale down operations to just the essential components. Next slide. Uh, this was uh, what I alluded to earlier uh, for agricultural support business. Can a company that manufactures labels or screw tops for wine bottles operate? Yes. So manufacturing packaging for food and beverage products may operate uh, in support of essential agricultural businesses. Social distancing and a protocol must be followed. Next slide, please. Uh, frequently asked question, I am a farm worker. My employer has not provided me with adequate personal protective equipment, also known as PPE, to use while working. What can I do? So again, ag is an essential business, but it must comply with shelter in place orders, social distancing and hygiene requirements, and must have the social distancing protocol in place. Uh, so in addition to the public face, facial covering order, um, which requires facial coverings uh, while outdoors, um, wait, they're required indoors and outdoors when the person is unable to maintain a six foot distance from another person at all times, which may uh, apply if someone is in the field and working closely uh, with another person. So that's the rule under the order. Um, if someone suspects a violation of the order, they can call local law enforcement, uh, the non-emergency line, and if a worker believes his or her employer is violating their rights as an employee, they may contact the Department of Industrial Relations Labor Commissioner. So um, that's, so those are your existing um, avenues presently. Next slide, please. I work in the agricultural industry and my boss wants me to provide verification that I am COVID-19 free to return to work, but my doctor won't test me. Can the health department provide verification? So testing is done under the order and by a physician when the physician determines this is medically necessary. If testing is conducted, the ordering physician may request results from the health department. A patient may request a copy of the test results from their physician. The health department does not provide verification of being infection free. If the patient was under quarantine and monitored by the health department, the health department may provide verification of quarantine completion. Next slide. Is homesteading allowed under the orders? So in this context, um, my understanding is that homesteading refers to a lifestyle that promotes self-sufficiency through growing one's own, own food and sometimes selling it to others. Um, this is different than homesteading uh, uh, for purposes of purchasing property and um, having bankruptcy protection, if anyone's familiar with that other use of that term. So this is about growing one's own food. Uh, under the order, uh, yes, gardening and producing one's own food at one's residence is not prohibited. It's part of essential activities. If a person is engaged in retail sale of fruits and vegetables or food, um, for instance, at a farmer's market, then you would be considered an essential business and would need to follow strictly follow the social distancing and hygiene requirements, and develop your social distancing protocol, and look to the state uh, public health department's guidance that we referred to earlier. So, um, you know, this is a little bit of a loose term, but, you know, are you doing it for your own use or are you retail? And, you know, be cognizant of what requirements may apply in each. Next slide. Can a community garden operate under this uh, shelter in place order? So a community garden can operate as an essential activity or an essential business 
as an agricultural operation providing food for participants, but only if it's operated for the purpose of food, uh, growing food, producing food, and in compliance with the order regarding social distancing and hygiene protocols. So what might that look like? Next slide. So your social distancing protocol for a community garden would include operated only for the purpose of growing food, soap and running water available on site, no more than one person in the garden at a time, unless it's sufficiently large to accommodate more than one person while maintaining the six foot distance at all time, wear masks, stay six feet away um, in compliance with the facial covering order. Next slide. Gardeners are, you know, encourage gardeners to bring their own tools or require it. Uh, tools need to be cleaned and not share. If they're shared, they need to be cleaned. Uh, gardeners uh, use only their own gloves and of course display signage uh, at the entrances and wherever it needs to be to educate uh, all users of the garden with what the rules are and block off any communal spaces uh, like benches that um, you know aren't uh, necessary to the growing of food. Next slide. So that is it for our uh, FAQs that we've gotten to date. Um, I'll let uh, Lauren take over here. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. So just listening here in this PowerPoint will be part of the webinar that we'll share with everyone afterwards. This is just a list of the different resources available. There is a business hotline being monitored uh, Monday through Friday. So if you have any questions that weren't answered here, um, you're more than welcome to call and they can kind of answer the questions to that phone line. You're also more than welcome to send us any more questions and we can work with Jennifer and her team to try to find answers and help you move forward to understand the, to best understand the health orders while keeping your employees and your business top of mind. Um, SoCoEmergency.org has a great dashboard that Dr. Reese has worked with her team on creating, kind of showing more of the metrics and the modeling behind understanding how the virus is affecting our county. Um, SonomaEDB.org also is website that we manage as the Economic Development Board and we have a lot of business resources available from financing options to employees affected by businesses and everything like that. So we encourage you to check these out if you have time and feel free to reach out if you have questions. Um, I'm happy to open it up to audience Q&A at this point and it's been pretty quiet so far. I don't have any questions but now is the time so feel free to dive in. I don't see any yet. <laughs> um, I can open, oh, here we go. One person asks, when can we expect antibody testing? Yeah, hi, that's a good question. Um, we have ordered the serology or the antibody test. It's a blood test. Mm -hmm. Just people know it's testing for your immunity. It's not testing for the actual virus. So it's not a test that's gonna be helpful at all for um, diagnosing when someone's actually infected, but they'll help us look at people and uh, uh, surveillance over the past, let's say three months, we could test all of a certain group to see how many of those people were infected in the past. I have it in a, hopefully a few weeks, we've put in an order, large scale order for the antibody test. It's just a matter of when we get it. Thank you. That's one question. I guess until more get added, I had a question that we've heard about is uh, there, we've heard a lot of rumors about necessary documentation that's required for employees who are driving from home to their essential place of business. Can you speak to if this is true, if someone needs documentation or if they need to practice social distancing in the car? If you could clarify on that, that would be great. Would you like me to answer? Uh, yes. Uh, no, we um, know, well, the the public health officer, the county is not issuing um, letters of permission to operate. We're not certifying businesses to operate or individual employees to go to work. So um, uh, on, if, for instance, the, I think the Grayton Day Labor um, Organization had asked about that. So uh, what, um, what, some, what an organization like that can do is they can have a copy of the order and if they are uh, directing my light just went out. Um, if they're directing their um, workers to different um, locations for certain purposes that are allowed under the order, then they can provide uh, a description of how that work complies under the order. So that if, if there is a desire to have something 
sort of in hand to show a law enforcement officer should they be approached. Um, the kind of like providing a social distancing protocol, the organization itself can provide its explanation of how they comply with the order if there's just a desire for a little bit of security. But it's, uh, we aren't providing that for individual businesses. It's really beyond our capacity right now. Got it. So just to be clear, so you would say, you know, we don't, there's not, it's not necessary to have a documentation. However, if you wanted to just ensure your employees were safe and ready, you could kind of prepare them as proactive measures for this other. Right. And particularly for a landscaping job, I think that there has been, um, you know, a lot of people may see a landscaper go out and in their mind, it's, that's not allowed because, oh, they're just, look, they're mowing, it's for cosmetic purposes only. And if they, you know, they can show, no, actually, you know, this facility has not been mowed in so long and we are approaching fire season, you know, there, there is a basis um, so I think that that's certainly a, a good practice um, to, to uh, avoid confusion. Okay, great, thank you. And then I had a quick question that came in on the chat. So this kind of ties in Dr. Mace to the original question about um, getting tested for antibodies. So another one, um, so with regards to how will antibodies, antibody tests be distributed? For example, who would have access to these tests? And will this process be used to determine which businesses are allowed to reopen and how? Yeah, I don't think the test would be used in any way to determine which businesses would open because it's looking at immunity and it's sort of throughout the community. So um, the public health lab will receive the test and they'll prioritize who we think needs to be tested for surveillance. It's not about who's infected or who's sick. It's about, okay, let's look at our first responders, for example. And follow them with the antibody test to better understand what percentage of them were ever infected with the virus. Or we might do a representative testing at a community clinics of, say, the first 200 people that come to the clinic for other reasons. Mm -hmm. Say, okay, we'd like to offer you an antibody test because we're looking to see what's the community prevalence of infection. So a randomized kind of thing. So again, it's not going to be used to set any policy around who opens and who, no, who doesn't and things like that. Those will be guided by all of our other um, measures that the governor has put out. Okay, great, thank you. Um, a quick question, are there enough tests in the county to test everyone showing symptoms? That's our goal at this point. And we're gonna, um, I think we already announced on the town hall last night that, that um, mass testing, and we're gonna do it in a priority wise, uh, basis with first starting with healthcare workers, symptomatic and asymptomatic, and then we're going to go to our first responders, that's symptomatic, and then the over 65 population, and then we'll go to uh, the people who are um, working in uh, the necessary essential businesses, so utilities and food um, providers, your group sort of at that point for testing for symptomatic folks. And then the entire community. So I'm hoping that within the next, say, three weeks to four weeks, we can start testing community-wide people who are symptomatic. It'll depend on us getting our swabs that we've ordered and we get that. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's a question. This is cannabis related. I don't know if you want to chime in, Sita. Um, can cannabis operators who are impacted by coronavirus receive extensions on their county cannabis taxes and or relief from late penalties? If so, how will this work and what could be counted as impacted? I guess answer that to the best of your ability or we can always follow up with the group. I think I'll have to defer to a follow up on that one. We haven't gotten that question yet and we haven't discussed it internally. So, um, but I will take that down and speak with tax council and the tax collector as well. They're the ones that administer the tax program. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Sita. Hopefully that helps for now, Lauren. <laughs> Um, in your opinion, is it possible people could have COVID-19 in December? I guess Dr. Mace, this could be coming towards you. So if, is it, in your opinion, is it possible that people could have COVID-19 in December? Oh, you're, you're on, on mute. mute. <laughs> could they have had it? Is that what you're saying in December? Yes. Yes, yeah, we won't know because the antibody test will tell us whether you've ever been infected but I won't be able to say, oh, you're infected in February or January or December because it's simply a measure of the antibodies or immunity. So I don't think we'll ever be able to figure out when our first case um, 
here in the county occurred, when the first case in the US occurred, et cetera. Or even for that matter, I'm not sure they could pinpoint when the first case in China occurred because we don't have that kind of specific testing. Okay, thank you. And then I've got another question, which this could probably be both of everyone. Can you expand more on the requirement for facial coverings as it applies to employees at essential businesses? For example, if employees work out of a building with separate offices, and if only a few employees are on site, each working in their own private office space, are masks required at all times? Right, so you know, we're really expecting people to use their judgment and common sense in these situations. The whole point of wearing the facial covering is to protect other people around you so that if you happen to be one of those asymptomatic uh, people who have COVID or uh, you know, that you might infect another person. So if you're sitting in your office by yourself with the door closed, I don't think you need to wear the facial covering because no one else there is uh, at risk. So I don't know, Jennifer uh, or Sita, if you want to add anything, but you know, I think it, this is, we can't make a order for every situation. Right, and I think that the order says, you know, before you enter um, a building where people are, other than your home, uh, you need to wear a mask. And there was some question or confusion of, as to whether that meant, well, you just only wear your mask as you cross the threshold into the building, and once you're in the building, you can take it off. That is not true. Um, you do have to continue to wear it while you're in the building with other people, um, and there may be these unique situations where there's just 100% no risk because you are isolated in an enclosed, your own enclosed space, like Dr. Mace, um, I, you know, said. So, but but the general rule under the order is, you know, wear a mask while you're inside, um, and also while you're in an outdoor enclosed space. So that could be um, the community garden. You know, you're in kind of a walled garden scenario, even though you're outside, you're still in an enclosed space, um, and so we want you to wear the um, facial coverings in those situations as well. Um, yeah. yeah, let me just add that at all times, be safe, you know? Mm -hmm. So a question about it, probably better you wear the facial covering. If you're wondering whether to or not, just go ahead and wear it because that's how we'll prevent community transmission. And then I kind of have a follow-up. So I think a question that could be sparked from this, okay, so we have three employees who all have their own offices. They can function with their doors closed. And then I guess what would your suggestion be? Say they've gotten their work done for the day and they're leaving and they leave with like the door open, you know, is it a matter of like sanitizing surfaces on their way out or just kind of having a clear entrance exit path? Like not saying every office should have this, but just if someone does have this scenario, how can they best like promote the um, social distancing or hygiene after they leave the office? Yeah, so if you want to wipe down the solid surfaces a desk or the doorknobs, that's fine. I mean, it would, it's only going to be helpful. It won't hurt anything, obviously. So I'm just trying to stay on top of being um, as vigilant as possible would be helpful. Yeah, Absolutely. Just, a, just a reminder, the, the order um, has a social distancing and hygiene requirements, and this applies to all, um, maintaining the six foot distance as we, we've repeated. Um, and frequently washing hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, as everyone has heard repeatedly in the media, I'm sure. Covering coughs and sneezes with a tissue, or if not possible, into your sleeve or elbow. Actually washing your hands afterwards. If, avoiding all social interaction outside the household when sick. Um, and so, and wiping down uh, frequently used surfaces is going to be a part of that. So it's, it's anything you can think of to kind of keep that a safe environment um, is going to be advised. Perfect. And then there was one other item on that. So for example, another example is what if you have more than one employee working at a large, in a large winery cellar? Like how best, just kind of implementing those social distancing protocols and hygiene, how would they best tackle that as an employer? If they're inside the building um, and they're not in their own enclosed space, I would say wear, wear your mask. Um, wipe down the surfaces. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wash your hands, soap and water. Okay. Um, sounds great. So yeah. I'm just check. <laughs> yeah, and just, then, uh, yeah, again, everyone... if, if you have any doubt, I think it's better to have the facial covering. And so, um, you know, we're all doing that in the county public health system. When we enter, we have, you know, monitoring of our temperature, a question of all of our symptoms. And then everybody in the building is wearing their covering. 
Um, I take my facial covering off when I go in my office and close the door. If the door is open, I wear the facial covering. Got it. Great. Thank you. So here's another one. As an employer, am I required to provide facial coverings for my employees who are reporting to work? Uh, that's not addressed in the order, um, but I think you certainly can make it part of your social uh, distancing protocol um, and make it a requirement of employment, but you should really consult uh, your own, you know, employment counsel uh, for specific guidance because we can't, we can't provide specific legal advice in that area. Is that asking whether the employer has to provide? Yes. Springs? Mm -hmm. um, okay. For the employees, that is. Yes. Yeah, I think we had put in our order that the employers are responsible. Oh, oh for then I misspoke. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, no, no problem. Um, I don't have a copy of it. Not necessarily like, problem. if you're a Safeway, for example, mm -hmm. you are responsible for ensuring that all of your employees have facial coverings. Either you're going to provide them or you're going to make sure they bring them or have access right. to them. But you're not responsible for people who walk into the store to yeah. purchase goods. Those people are covered under the general public facial covering order that enter the store. They're supposed to be wearing a facial covering, but you don't have to, as an employer, provide facial coverings for people walking into your store. But if you notice that people are coming into your enclosed facility without facial coverings, you can always notify public health or the law enforcement and just say, you know, people need to be wearing these things and I've noticed that people are not. So, um, yeah. Okay, great. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, thank you so much. And then we've got a couple more. So we've got about four more questions in nine minutes. So we'll see if we can get them all answered. Uh, another one, this is for cannabis. Can cannabis operators who are impacted by coronavirus receive extensions? Oh, wait, no, that's another one, sorry. Is the county continuing to process cannabis applications that have been submitted right now? Are new applications being accepted? Do these answers differ whether we're talking about PRMD or Ag Department permits. My understanding permits are that still being processed right now. That is um, an essential function of both Permit Sonoma and the Ag Department. And I believe that Ag Commissioner is on, so I'll let him chime in as well. Um, but that is an essential function. And so those departments are still working on cannabis permits. Um, we are figuring out how to do public hearings remotely. And so people may have noticed we haven't had any public hearings for cannabis permits, but they are still being accepted and still being processed. And we're moving forward with figuring out how to do public hearings in a way that protects everybody's due process and allows for participation. And I'll just comment that, you know, that's um, when she says essential function, that's the government's definition of its own essential function here for uh, permit Sonoma in particular. Um, each, you know, the cities are going to have their own sort of view of their essential functions. And uh, just because you've been issued a permit to build something doesn't necessarily mean that that act of construction is also deemed an essential business. So uh, permit applicants are to exercise caution to not assume that just because you are moving through the permit process and receive your permit, that you are then also authorized to build under the um, order. So uh, keep that in mind. Yeah, and I would encourage if any folks have kind of questions about construction related to your business, we are doing a construction and trades kind of similar webinar this coming Friday and we can definitely- I'm not sure that that's still, that may not be the case. That may have been rescheduled, but let's- Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, we've got a couple more in here. Let's see. Thank you everyone for your patience. Okay, so a follow-up question as opposed to if you're required to provide it for your employees, facial coverings. I want my employees to wear facial coverings. Can I require them to? Uh, you should consult your own um, employment counsel on that question. Yeah, so this is from an employer. Yes. One more time, Lauren. Absolutely. So her original question was if she's required to provide facial coverings. And then as a follow-up, she wants her employees to wear masks. Can she require them to do so? Okay, so the order states that for any business, the employer needs to ensure and is responsible for the employees having facial coverings. So either 
you can provide the facial coverings or you can make sure that your employees have access to facial coverings or employees can bring their own homemade facial coverings. But yes, the employer is uh, responsible to ensuring the employees have facial coverings. They're not masks, they're facial coverings. Again, we don't really want people to go out and put N95 masks, which is not required, or even isolation or surgical masks. Those are in short supply and are needed by our healthcare providers. So please encourage the uh, facial coverings that are homemade. Okay. And then maybe what we could do as a follow-up, if we get any more questions that we can't answer, perhaps I can try to find that excerpt from the order and we can include that in the follow-up to all the participants today as well, just so they have clarity on that too. Okay, let's try and see if we can get one more in here. All right. So this is a follow-up with regards to the antibody immunity question, Dr. Mace. Um, so one of our listeners is, I'm curious about the antibody immunity because my business partner traveled from Australia back to California in late November and we all, owners and employee, ended up getting incredibly sick, dry cough, fever, etc. We are also at high exposure, cash only delivery service. So I'm coming into contact with a lot of people in exposed surfaces. I would really like to get to get the immunity test so I feel more comfortable at work going in there knowing that I've already had it. Thank us all for our hard work. <laughs> yeah, I think um, that's the kind of setting in which potentially we could see who all was infected. Um, of course, um, you know, any test is going to be only so good. It, I think the antibody test is about 96% uh, with the ability to detect previous infection. Um, so as soon as we get this test, we can start allocating resources for testing people. Okay, fantastic. All right, folks, we've got about four minutes left. Are there any other questions that you want us to answer right now? If not, I can definitely provide you an email address so you can send anything else that might come up after the fact. Please just let us know we're here to help and hopefully provide a little more clarity. <laughs> Lauren, can I ask the person with the cannabis tax question to follow up with me directly with a little bit more specifics? Um, thinking about it some more and thinking if you're a dispensary, then you're paying taxes on gross receipts. So if your sales have decreased, your tax liability should as well. And if you're a cultivator, if you decreased your cultivation area, you can always contact the Ag Commissioner's office um, to verify your cultivation area and, and the basis for your tax. Do you want to go ahead and send her your email address perhaps, and then you two can break it down more? Yeah, that would be great. I think those are good. Good information there. <laughs> okay, are there, another question, are there any special cannabis business support funds since we are not able to apply for any federal funding or loans? That sounds like an EDB question to me. Um, as of right now, I'm not aware of any special funds that are available um, with regards to federal funding. I would encourage business owners to look at the different grants that are available because those aren't necessarily federal funding like there's a couple of local, um, like Hello Alice, Salesforce, Google, some other companies like that are putting together grants for small business. So my suggestion would be to try to reach out and look at those alternative sources of funding in the meantime. All right, anyone else? We got a couple minutes left. Okay. And then I'll go ahead and I'll drop um, the UDB Health for the County Council and Public Health to host this event. So we're happy to receive any questions that we can send to our partners and hopefully get some feedback when we send the recap. We will share this webinar once it's um, downloaded. We're gonna have uh, closed captioning for Spanish for those of you listening on the Spanish translation channel. And if you guys have anything else, just let us know. I do have one last question. <laughs> um, Dr. Mace, what is your opinion on what is going to happen? Do you think we will have a second wave? Well, I mean, I think we have to just look at the data. So we basically um, put into place a shelter in place uh, order and people were really great about abiding by it. <clears throat> and we saw a huge decrease in what would have been expected, a lot less than expected based on our modeling, because I think people were so good about staying at home and following the orders. So as we begin to loosen shelter in place, uh, the thinking is that we will see more cases. Of course, it's a corollary. You, you know, stayed, stayed at home and we kept you know, people from interacting out in the community. So we decreased our numbers of cases. When people start going out again into the community, we'd expect to see cases. How can we mitigate this? 
with aggressive testing and finding people who are cases and getting them out of the community. That's one of our obvious ways we can deal with this. I'm hoping with our very aggressive testing strategy that we're starting this Saturday, and you'll hear more of it through a press release and uh, or any other communications through social media, that we start targeting people at high risk first and then lower and lower prioritize risk and we'll find the cases and have them isolate at home, follow up with their contacts, find the secondary cases. And in that way, hopefully we'll um, blunt the resurgence we start, um, relaxing shelter in place. So thank you. All right, so we're just about out of time. I just wanted to say thank you so much, Dr. Mace, Jennifer, and Sita for your time today. We truly appreciate it. Thank you to our translator, Ricardo, for jumping on the line to also provide additional clarity in another language. If you have any questions, I just sent a note to the uh, panelists and all the attendees. Feel free to email us with any other questions. We're happy to try and provide any clarity, but um, hang in there and we'll all get through this together. All right, have a great day, everyone.